the preferred vehicle of President Obama abusing his authority, abusing his constitutional authority. Now, the silver lining of that is everything done with executive power can be undone with executive power. So I have pledged on day one, I will rescind every single illegal and unconstitutional executive action Barack Obama has done. That means on day one, his efforts to restrict the Second Amendment go away with a strike of a pen. That means on day one, his illegal executive amnesty goes away with a strike of a pen. The reason I can end Common Core at the federal level is because Obama is abusing executive power using race to the top funds in the Department of Education to force it on the states. That's one avenue. The second av avenue of change is foreign policy. And foreign policy can change the fastest. It's worth remembering that Iran released our hostages the day Reagan was sworn in. And then the third is legislation, and that can only be done with the people behind you, which is why the two big legislative initiatives I'm campaigning on are repealing Obamacare and adopting a simple flat tax to abolish the IRS. Mr. Trump, if Senator Cruz is known for opposing deals, you literally wrote the book on making them. Senator Cruz has mentioned that on the trail. What would you say to those conservatives who are concerned that a deal maker will just perpetuate the same deals in Washington and the way that things run now? How do you disturb no, the status quo? No, a good deal maker will make great deals, but will do it the way our founders thought it should be done. People get together, they make deals. Ronald Reagan did it with Tip O'Neill very successfully. You didn't hear so much about executive orders if you heard about it at all. You have to be able to get a consensus. Now, the real person, like it was mentioned about the deal with Iran, how bad a deal is that? It doesn't get any more amateurish than that. A good deal maker would never make a deal like that. With Congress, you have to get everybody in a room and you have to get them to agree. But you have to get them to agree what you want. And that's part of being a deal maker. You can't leave the White House, go to Hawaii and play golf for three weeks and be a real deal maker. It doesn't work that way. You have to get people in, grab them, hug them, kiss them, and get the deal done. But it's got to be the deal that you want. Governor Kasich. Yeah. Is the problem with Washington that there are too many deals or too few? Well, right now, the deals are, there's no leadership. I mean, a lot of the things that we're talking about here tonight, you know, on the border and uh, so many of the things, you know, what we should be doing on foreign policy. You know what the problem is, uh, Mary Catherine, is there's not a leader that gets somebody to rise up. You have to have a leader that can inspire. I mean, actually, some of what Donald was saying is true. Look, do you know how hard it was to get the, federally the federal budget balanced? You have to plead with people. To do what we've done in Ohio, you have to plead with people. Then you go back down to Washington and do the same thing. You see, we have to remind people we're Americans before we're Republicans and Democrats. And when we wait and when we delay, what we end up doing, Mary Catherine, is we make the United States weaker. In fact, it's a foreign policy issue because people look at America not solving problems and they say, what, what, what are they doing over there? So the point is you have to work with people. The problem with executive authority for the president, it's really bad news for this reason. Since he's given up on working with Congress, he thinks he can impose anything he wants. He's not a king. He's a president. An executive order should be used, frankly, in consolidation and with co consulting with the leadership in the, in the Congress. I've done it in Ohio. I consult. I can use executive orders, but I don't trump the legislature because if you do, you aggravate them, you anger them, and then the long-term prospects get bleak. We have to solve problems in America by coming together, Republicans and Democrats, Americans first, party and ideology second in the second back seat of this country. That's what we need to do. And we can do it. And we can do it. This is a this is an important subject. I agree with everything that's been said here about repealing unconstitutional rules and rules that are creating real burdens for investing that creates jobs. But we also ought to get back to being a Tenth Amendment country, uh, country as well, a country that respects the states to be able to make more decisions. And in the Bush administration, we would shift t transportation dollars back to the states. I trust Kasich and Christie to build the roads and the infrastructure of their states than Washington, D.C. EPA delegated authority back back to the states, education dollars back to the states. I would like to see reform take place all across the country where there's more vouchers, more freedom. 
if we did that, we would shrink government's power in Washington, D.C., and we would have a much more effective government where people would begin to trust our government again, because now no one believes it works. Let me, Mary Catherine, I would just say this to you. You must have an agenda that you are ready to move on in the first hundred days. Jeb is right. If you delay and you wait, uh, the, the Washington operators will, will take you down. I can tell you this, in the first hundred days, I will have legislation to freeze federal regulations, have them reviewed by the vice president, reduce state taxes on individuals, reduce taxes on corporations, have a fiscal plan to balance the budget, get the border protected, and begin to fix Social Security in the first hundred days. So anybody who's here tonight, if I get elected president, head out tomorrow and buy a seatbelt, because there's going to be so much happening in the first hundred days, it's going to make your head spin, and we're going to move America forward. I promise you, we're going to move us forward. He mentioned me. He mentioned me. He mentioned me. One other thing that I think we ought to do, well, along with repealing Obamacare, we need to shift all this power of health care, which is the most egregious form of federal power that is suppressing wages and income, and allow governors to have the Medicaid plans so that they can create 21st century Medicaid insurance for, for people that are stuck in poverty. There's so much that could be done, but I don't trust Washington to do it. I trust the state capitals to be the place to be the source of innovation and reform in this country. Thank you, Governor. Mary Catherine, thank you. We want to turn to something the governor of New Hampshire said. <laughs> no, Jeb mentioned me. It's time for me to go again. I didn't mention him the second time. <laughs> he says he didn't mention me the second time. I thought I heard it, Jeb. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you all very much for listening and being patient with all of us tonight. Thank you. A connection here on the stage. We're, we're going to move on to the, what the governor of New Hampshire said just this week, and, and that is that heroin overdose is now the second leading cause of death in this state. You don't need me to tell you that. But there's another number. 48% of the people here in this state know someone who has abused heroin. Josh, who covers this for WMUR, has the next question. Uh, you're all aware, candidates, that this is a major problem here in New Hampshire. It's a very deadly problem as well. Last month, New Hampshire Senators Kelly Ayotte, a Republican, and Gene Shaheen, a Democrat, they went down to Washington along with the police chief of the state's largest city to testify before the Judiciary Committee in D.C. Senator Cruz, you're a member of that committee. Your campaign schedule didn't allow you to attend this. Even so, the police chief called your absence outrageous, given the severity of the problem. Last week, though, you told a personal story of a close family member's struggle with addiction. What can you say to law enforcement right now to convince them that you understand the severity of this problem and you're not just saying what people want to hear days before the primary? Well, Josh, as you noted, this is a problem that, for me, I understand firsthand. Uh, my older sister, Miriam, who was my half-sister, uh, struggled her whole life with drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, my father and her mom divorced when she was a little girl, and she was angry her whole life. And she ended up marrying a man who'd been in and out of jail. She then became a single mom, and she herself went to jail several times, and she ended up spending some time in a crack house. I, I still remember my father and me driving up to get Miriam out of that crack house to try to convince her she needed to be a mom to, to my nephew, Joey. Um, she wasn't willing to listen. She was not willing to change the path she was on. She was angry. Um, I was, had just gotten my first job uh, coming out of law school. I took a $20,000 loan on a credit card to put my nephew Joey in, in Valley Forge Military Academy. He was in sixth grade at the time to pay his way through that. And about five, six years ago, Miriam died of an overdose. It was, the coroner ruled it accidental. We don't know. She went to sleep one night had taken too many pills, and, and Joey walked in and found her dead. This is an absolute epidemic. We need leadership to solve it. L solving it has to occur at the state and local level with programs like AA and counseling and churches and charities, but it also has to occur securing the borders because you've got Mexican cartels that are smuggling vast amounts of heroin into this country. We know how to secure the borders. What is missing is the political will to do it, and as president, 
I will secure the border. We will end this deluge of drugs that is flowing over our southern border and that is killing Americans across this country. Uh, Governor Christie, you've talked a lot about this issue here in New Hampshire, uh, state reforms, criminal justice reforms, access to treatment. Uh, to Senator Cruz's point, let's take it a step further. Uh, would you be willing to engage in cross-border enforcement into Mexico, the place where law enforcement here in New Hampshire has traced a lot of this supply back to, would you engage in cross-border enforcement without the cooperation of the Mexican government? Of course I would. As a former United States attorney who spent seven years of my life fighting this on the streets of my state, I would do that. But we need to do more. And let me tell you what we've done in New Jersey, Josh. We're working with the folks in New Hampshire in their legislature right now to show them how we're helping to solve this problem in New Jersey. Not just for this campaign. Three years ago, we pro I proposed a law that we signed into, into effect, which said that anyone who is a nonviolent, non-dealing, first-time drug offender no longer goes to prison in New Jersey. They go to mandatory inpatient drug treatment. What's happened is crime has gone down 20 percent in those three years. The prison population has gone down 10 percent. We've now closed the state prison, closed the state prison, and we're turning into a drug rehabilitation facility so people can get the tools they need. Listen, everyone out there knows this in New Hampshire. This is a disease. It's not a moral failing. It's a disease, and we need to give people the treatment they need. And let me tell you why, because I'm pro-life. And I'm pro-life not just for the nine months in the womb. I'm pro-life for when they get out, and it's a lot more complicated. 16-year-old heroin-addicted drug girl on the floor of the county lockup. I'm pro-life for her life. The 42-year-old lawyer who's taking Oxycontin and can't get out of bed and support his family. I'm pro-life for his life. Every one of those lives is an individual gift from God. And the last thing is this. These efforts we've taken over the last three years, 2015 in New Jersey, for the first time in four years, drug overdose deaths have gone down, not up. I'll bring the same solutions to the country. Governor Christie, we're from the floor. Thanks very much. Dave Martha, back to you. Thank you, Governor Christie. Thank you, Josh. Our partner in this debate, the Independent Journal Review, has collected questions from some prominent conservatives around the country. Here's a videotaped question from radio host Larry O'Connor. In 2008, we saw how motivated an electorate can be when they think their vote is making history. Let's face it, if Hillary Clinton is the nominee for the Democrats, you'll be running against the prospect of the first woman president. How will you change that narrative and motivate the electorate behind your candidacy? Well, Mr. Trump, well, I'm going to give that question to you. You, yes. took it, you took it away anyway. Oh, okay, good. It looked like he was looking right at me right there. Uh, I think that I look at what's going on. I look at all of the polls. I do very, very well against Hillary Clinton. I can tell you I'm the last person that she wants to run against. And I think you can see what we've done in terms of galvanizing. I've, I've been all over the country. We're, uh, last night, I was in South Carolina. We had 12,000 people. It's set up in about four days. We have galvanized, and we've created a movement. A lot of it has to do with, as an example, Josh's question on drugs. I'm the first one that said, build a wall. But I mean a real wall, not a toy wall like they have right now. A real wall. And you'll solve lots of problems. But we will galvanize the people of this country, and we will beat Hillary Clinton. Because Assuming that she runs, by the way, how she gets away with the email stuff is hard to believe. So I don't know that she's going to be running, but on the assumption she runs, I mean, look, and speaking of that, if she runs, she's running for one reason. She's going to be able to run for one reason, and that's because the Democrats are protecting her, because so many people have done so much less than her, and they were absolutely, their lives have been destroyed. But on the assumption they do protect her, I will win the election, and we will win it by a lot. We will win it handily. We cannot have another four years of essentially Barack Obama. Martha? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Trump. I'm going to go to Senator Rubio on this. How would you change that narrative? I think it's already happening. Look at the turnout in Iowa. A historic number of people came out and voted in those caucuses. They're saying the same thing's going to happen here in New Hampshire. Look at the rallies that every single person on the stage is having. Much higher numbers than you used to see in the past, and here's why because people are starting to understand very clearly that this election is going to be a turning point. That 2016 is not just a choice between Republican or Democrat. It is a referendum on our identity as a nation and as a people. 
And so here's what Hillary Clinton needs to understand. We're going to have our primary. We're going to have our debates, which, by the way, are twice as many as the Democrats have been willing to have themselves. But we're going to bring this party together. And we are going to defeat Hillary Clinton because she is unqualified to be the president of the United States of America. She put classified information on her computer because she thinks she's above the law. And anyone who lies to the families of people who have lost their loved ones in the service of our country, like she did in Benghazi, can never be the commander in chief of the United States of America. Thank you, Senator Rubio. Awesome. Dr. Carson, I want to go to you on Larry O'Connor's question.